Alright, welcome to the final review for English 1060, and again, kind of tonight's theme is remembering what you should never forget. Right, so, in terms of the final, what the um, questions will be are conceptual. You know, this is a thinking person's final. I'm not going to ask you for definitions. I'm going to ask you for, you know, application type questions. So if I give you a thesis, can you define it? If I give you a format, questions can you you know so review the homework review the lectures everything right review your essay comments all sorts of things so again if I ask you a format question right you should recognize the difference between MLA and NAPA format uh, you cite the author and page number in a parentheses right uh, unless you name the author in a sentence right so uh, the citation is always at the end of the page regardless of where you place the paraphrase or quote so we have uh, two examples really for MLA, right? So let's say I'm quoting, right? I would say Milton in his estimation, quote, had to struggle subtly and crucially uh, with a major precursor in Spencer and this struggle both formed and malformed him. So it comes from Bloom 11. And note how there's no punctuation or anything like that. There's just the last name in the page number. Or if I'm paraphrasing, right? And let's say I named the author, so I would say uh, that should be Milton, right? In Bloom's est estimation, uh, worried about how much Spencer influenced him both in negative and positive ways, right? So that's my paraphrase, so then I just put the page number. So again, you you did homework on this, uh, you've done essays on this, obviously, but just to get familiar. So if I give you an end text, right? Note the format, right? Author's last name, comma, first, period, title of book, place of publication, colon, publisher, comma, the date, and then medium of publication. So we have an example, right? We have bear, comma, poo, period, honeybees, period, New York, colon, fiction, press, comma, 2004, and then we, again, double space, and tab after that first line, and then we write print. And again, you should be familiar with both forms, just in the basic, um, because again, you, know, you will have to take another English class, uh, certain liberal arts classes will have you do an MLA as well, and so you should be familiar with a little bit both APA and MLA, because again, the science classes will be APA, liberal arts will be MLA. We have uh, three different ways we could do the in-text citation for APA. We could do where I have the name, you know, I name the author, so the date always follows the author's name in parentheses, and then I have my quote, and then in parentheses there's P period, then the page number. In APA, the citation always follows the quote, so if my quote is in the middle of the sentence, right, same thing, author's last name and date are in parentheses, um, and then we have the page number, again, follow the quote, or if we don't mention the author's name, we have to, again, wherever the quote or paraphrase ends, we have Jones, comma, the date, comma, P period, then the page number. So again, just be aware of the different formats, right, for APA. Same thing with in-text citation, just get the general idea. So let's say for a book, for example. So we have author, comma, initials with periods, then the year of publication, period, title of the work. Again, the rest of the words will be lowercase, except for the first ones. And then location, colon, publisher. And so we have an example, right? So we have uh, uh, coffee, R, uh, R period, C period, comma, and Valencia, comma, R period, R period, 1901 period, APA guide, preparing manuscripts for period, and then Washington, comma, DC, colon, then APA period. Right? So again, just make a note of those aspects there. Go back to the original lectures, right? All academic essays are guided by an opinionated assertion, right? The thesis. So the purpose of the essay is justify and defend your claim, right? Your thesis with logical support and reasoning. So if I give you a sentence, right? Is it debatable or is it simply an observation, right? Because the thesis always must be debatable. It can't simply be an observation. So if I ask you to write a thesis, if I give you a thesis, you should be able to tell me if it's an argument or not. Remember the types of thesis statements too, right? We have analytical, we have expository or explanatory, and then argumentative, right? While all three are arguments, obviously um, the evaluation-based one is what we see with the third one. And then we have, of course, the implied thesis, which obviously you won't really write too much in college. Technically, every thesis is an argument, so the third category is a bit misleading, but there is a difference between an analytical interpretation-based argument and an explanatory argument and an evaluation-based argument, right? So, um, again, it simply shows what types of essays you will write in this setting. 
Remember topic sentence two, right? Every topic sentence should have an argument. It should introduce the new subtopic of a paragraph and again should convey that clear argument. So any topic sentence can follow some sort of pattern where there's a connection to the previous paragraph's idea, then the new idea, then maybe even a connection to the thesis, right? So for example, uh, besides writing unnecessary intake of toxins, organic foods are healthier to eat because they contain higher amounts of antioxidants, right? So we know what the previous paragraph is about, organic foods ridding unnecessary intake of toxins. The thesis is about organic foods being healthier, right? And then this paragraph is going to have to prove that they actually contain higher amounts of oxidants, oh, excuse me, antioxidants compared with inorganic food, right? So we have a good clear argument, we have a good understanding of what's in the previous paragraph, and we have a good understanding of the thesis, right? Now, the point of view issue, remember there are three main points of view. We have first person, which is I, me, my, why, right? And that's a singular. You know, I believe, I think, all these things we should be careful of and not writing typically. The plural, us, we are, right? Rarely we should we should use it because it's vague, right? There's a second person, which we should never use, right? It's informal, right? There's the direct, you, you all, right? And then the implied command verb, stop, go, think, right? And then third person, right? The he, she, it, right? Singular, and then they, plural, they're plural. While each point of view is helpful in many different writing situations, again, if we were writing instructions, we would want to use the second person. But, again, we're not. You know, we're writing academic arguments, so we want to keep it to the third person typically. Sometimes the first person if we're doing a reflection essay, but rarely uh, would you do that in this setting. Remember, too, that about evidence, there are two types of evidence. First-hand research is what you conducted for essay 2. Interviews, right, experiments, surveys, personal experience, anecdotes. And then, of course, the second-hand research, right, research you were getting from various texts. Obviously, this is what you did for essay 3 and essay 4, right, where, you know, they're supplied and compiled by others, books, periodicals, websites, so forth. Regardless of what types of sources you use, each one, again, should be credible. So you should be able to figure out what a reliable source is, an accurate and trustworthy source this is, right? And go back to that one homework we had, right? Think about that star criteria, right? Uh, as you research and begin to incorporate your findings, you should consider the star message, right? Sufficiency, is there enough evidence, right? Is the chosen data representative or typical? Does it sound accurate or up to date, right? And is it relevant to the claim, right? And so, that, again, remember these kind of, you know, four aspects that are very important, right? Is there enough evidence to help prove what you're trying to prove is there enough data that seems typical right or is it just you know if it's a survey only of 100 people can we really rely on that is it accurate up to date right and is it relevant along the kind of same lines of analysis and figuring out you know ideas of truth seeming right uh, regardless of the approach subtext right is the goal of many analyses so it's the underlining meaning behind what is said or written right so go back to that lecture about uncovering subtext and analyzing it's very important you know, again when you research to figure out you know where is this truth right how, how should I believe this source and so the subtext is often implicit sometimes metaphorical meaning right it's the meaning we derive from what is not directly stated or presented we encode subtext right in order to understand it and that's very important and go back to the lecture to look at all those really good examples the Tolman model, again, very important, right? Tolman's model provides that there are three essential aspects to the rhetorical argument, right? There's the claim, there's the data, and then there's the warrant, right? So we have, again, the three essential components. We can look at it th at the macrocosm level, right? The essay should have a thesis. Every supporting paragraph is the data, and then your conclusion is the warrant. And we can look at it but at the microcosm level, the paragraph level, right? Every paragraph should have a topic sentence. There should be sufficient data to help prove this argument. And then we go into the warrant, right? The synthesis, right? So three essential points to every argument. So remember my example. I'm saying I'm an American, I need to prove my nationality, right? I could say I was born in North Carolina, right? That's my data. And so what's our synthesis? Anyone born in North Carolina is a legal citizen. So what's important about that conclusion, and this is why you can't just rush your conclusion paragraphs, or you shouldn't rush your conclusion paragraphs, Tolman argues that the claim and the data cannot hold without a sufficiently strong warrant, right? Or the weakest argument is the one with, of course, the weakest warrant. So that conclusion and that sentence that this sentence in each supporting paragraph and the conclusion in the essay as a whole, right, are... are so essential to the argumentative process because that's where you really show how your points are valid. There are a few 
additions to the model, right? There's the qualifier if you have any exceptions, the rebuttal, right? The counter argument, and then the further backing, right? The further synthesis, right? So again, while the claim data and warrant are essential, right? You need claim data warrant. Any argument, you have to have a claim data warrant. The other parts of qualifier, rebuttal, and backing are not necessary, but they're again helpful, right? Because again, the qualifier states the strength of the claim by discussing exceptions or review the lecture. The rebuttal to the claim considers any kind of counter arguments, much like again the classical model. And then the backing provides extra strength to the warrant, especially if the warrant is not wildly accepted or understood, right? So it further extends that thesis, further extends that warrant, right? Remember, the counter argument itself has three stages. So in order to introduce a counter argument, you should acknowledge, right? You should provide a clear summary of the opponent's viewpoint or viewpoints. Then you accommodate, right? You concede how a small part to the opposition has validity or merit, right? So you don't say that they're completely correct, right? That, that they're somewhat correct. And then you refute, right? You argue against the opponent, pointing out any kind of misinterpretations, illogical examples, misrepresentations, or overlooked ideas. Right? When you counter argue again, um, you avoid, you sh and should avoid ever switching sides, right? Yet uh, you momentarily show that you know what your opponents argue, and acknowledge how some part of their argument is sound. So remember, that was one key issue I saw with. Uh, a lot of your homeworks, right, you just completely switch sides, right? That's not a counter argument. It's not point counterpoint. What you do is you use these stages, right? So you, you maintain your argument. You acknowledge that here's what the, the opposition is saying, right? Then you accommodate. Well, here's what they're saying is correct. And then you refute. Here's where they're completely wrong, right? And so that's the kind of key issue. It's just you don't switch sides. It's not point counterpoint. You are still maintaining your argument, but you're just acknowledging that the other side exists. You're saying that part of their idea is good, but the rest of it is bad, right? And that's the kind of key issue with that counter argument in our essays. Remember, too, that kind of hierarchy of disagreement, right? You know, just to kind of show the levels of how we could argue. And obviously, we want to, you know, go to the top three levels, right, where we counter argue, refute, and then, of course, refute the central point, right? That we don't want to name call and, you know, have character attacks and things like that. Uh, remember always the forms of diction, right? So make sure you can define and point out each diction, right? Slang, idioms, right? Colloquial, regional, conversational, standard, and erudite, right? Because this is a major issue I saw with a lot of people's writings at times. You know, you get slips into that conversational diction. So really, you know, make sure you know the difference between that conversational and then, of course, standard diction. Now remember too that all the lectures on the professional writing, you know, any professional document makes an argument in some form or another. All professional communications use that three point system, right? Thesis, support, and conclusion, right? The Tolman model, right? Claim data warrant, right? So your resume, cover letter, even a memo if you were to write that, you know, still kinda argue your ethos, right? It shows your credibility, your professionalism, all sorts of things, right? So and of course you need to apply academic research, right, and argumentation to any professional document. Again, this was just a brief overview to kind of remind you all the kind of concepts that you're going to be dealing with with the final. Obviously, if you have any questions, always email. If not, good luck finishing up final projects. And, you know, good luck studying for finals. And take care.